Welcome to the Screen Crush Break Room. I'm Ryan Airy. Zack Snyder fans scored a huge win against the corporate suits at Warner Brothers. After crying out into the void for years, they have made their voices heard. The Snyder Cut was released. We saw it, and it was... Well, it was what it was. If you're a fan of Zack Snyder, you loved it. If you're not, then you probably still haven't finished it. But his fans weren't happy. They wanted more. Now it's hashtag restore the Snyderverse, as his fans review bomb pretty good Warner Brothers movies to harass the studio into spending a few billion dollars to give Snyder carte blanche with their most valuable IP. Suck it, Warner Brothers. Suck it. Yeah, suck it, Warner Brothers. This campaign got me thinking, what is the Snyderverse anyways? How can we define it? What's it saying about a genre on a philosophical level? We live in a society. And how does it compare to the Marvel Cinematic Universe? Now I know I've made a lot of videos comparing Marvel and DC movies because I think it's an interesting exercise in how the studios choose to execute some of my favorite characters on screen. But it's natural to compare these two franchises because they follow the same format, same genre, and after all, Warner Brothers was trying to copy Marvel Studios' template. It's like looking in a mirror, only not. So I think there's one scene that really says what these two universes are about. Why one is this. And the other is this. First, let's go through a few of the franchise's many similarities. They are both made up of franchises of interconnected solo films that seed team-up films made by top-tier Hollywood talent. The first film was a solo story that showed the origin of the franchise's main character. Now, after deliberating on whether or not to reveal their superhero life, their appearance as a hero changes the world forever. Each of these meta-franchises has a specific tone that they stick to throughout their films, at least at first. Both franchises feature the king of an isolated kingdom locked in a power struggle with a relative. Another film shows the exploits of a hero in a world war, and another shows a female protagonist in a period piece, keeping her abilities secret so they don't affect the timeline as a whole. There is also a team-up movie about a gang of colorful criminals banding together to save a world. Both franchises would eventually feature light-hearted comedies that loosely incorporate into the larger story. Now, both studios were also plagued with infighting that led to the cancellation of projects by auteur filmmakers. And each team-up movie features a cosmic threat that arrives seeking a magical box and teased a sequel where an all-powerful desperate from space would threaten our heroes. Now, there are obviously a few key differences between these franchises. The Snyderverse movies have a darker tone and desaturated color palette. But it's funny because, you know, in the comic book world, the Marvel comics are the darker ones, and yeah, the yeah. DC was the, was the you know, bright, uh, happier one. But it's, it's this weird thing that's paradigm switch, which is kind of fun. I, I like it. <laughs> Zack Snyder's movies also have more striking visuals, and their heroes take on a mythic quality. The DC movies are also tasked with reinventing characters that audiences saw less than a decade before, and that's very challenging. Another Batman, another origin story, The Pearls, and another Superman just seven years after Brandon Routh wore the tiny S on his chest. This kind of thing can wear audiences out. I mean, just ask Andrew Garfield. So good. There's also very little joy in the Zack Snyder films. His characters are very sad people. These are superheroes who hate being superheroes. Hello darkness, my old friend. In the MCU, the heroes use their powers with a childlike glee. Yeah, I can fly. Having super strength and flying and being part of a super club almost seems like fun. Ah! But to really understand any work of art, you have to examine the artists who created it. Once you understand the lens this artist sees their world through, you can understand their art. For instance, Steven Spielberg's mother was a concert pianist and his father was a computer engineer. So now the ship at the end of Close Encounters takes on a whole new meaning. <laughs> This was Spielberg's way of trying to communicate with an alien life form, his parents. The Snyderverse, by definition, is the result of one man's vision. I think the reason that his DC movies never connected with me is that he wasn't trying to adapt the comics for the big screen, like he did for 300 or The Watchmen. Instead, he presented fresh takes on these characters, made from his own personal worldview. This is fascinating, and something we have almost never seen in superhero movies, except with the possible exception of Ang Lee's Hulk and Fant Forstick. Say that again? So you can't understand the Snyderverse or even compare it to the MCU without understanding Zack Snyder. We have to understand the lens that he views the world through, the impulses that drive his creativity, before we can understand the films that he creates. Disclaimer, I have 
nothing against Zack Snyder as a person or an artist. He seems like a great guy. I'm not a hater, I just think he and I have very different understandings of these characters. I do think that he's a true artist, one of the few Hollywood filmmakers with a style so distinct. You can look at one of his movies on some guy's phone over his shoulder on a bus and say, that's a Zack Snyder movie. In a world filled with generic crap like Gods of Egypt and Pirates of the Caribbeans, that's a really cool thing. So who is Zack Snyder? He was born in Green Bay, Wisconsin. His mother was a painter and a photographer, and I imagine she encouraged his creative interests. And being around paintings as a child would have taught him about composition and the importance of strong imagery. Snyder's films are filled with striking slow motion that pops off the screen like paintings or motion posters. Now I'm assuming that she was a more creative influence than his father, who was an executive recruiter, according to Wikipedia. Snyder was raised a Christian scientist, which is very interesting. Now this is a sect of Christianity that believes that the physical world is not real, or at least that it's a shadow of our true heavenly existence. Luminous beings so are not this crude matter. To quote Snyder, Christian scientists believe that part of our journey is to transcend this reality through Christ-like living. Being raised with this belief could have contributed to his exaggerated view of reality, how it emphasizes even the smallest details through slow motion. One of Snyder's favorite books as a child was Jonathan Livingston Siegel. He told the New York Times, a lot of beliefs about the metaphysical aspects of Christian science were illustrated in Jonathan Livingston Siegel. Now this book could potentially tell us a lot about Snyder's worldview. The novel is about a seagull who isn't content to just fly from the sea to the shore like the other gulls. This bird wants to be amazing at flying. So he defies the wishes of his taciturn father and pursues his passion. Now because Snyder read this as a kid, it makes me wonder if he related the seagull's father to his own. You know, you see someone with a Green Lantern shirt on and most dorks are like, yeah, cool, Green Lantern. But my dad is like, what is that? <laughs> a man from the business world who is skeptical about his son's creative pursuits. I mean, I have no idea. I'm just speculating. So the seagull meets two other birds who take him to a higher plane of existence, a world only found through the perfection of knowledge. This idea that you can transcend reality through perfection is one of the tenets of Christian science. Now, I believe you can see this reflected in how Snyder portrays his heroes. Whether they represent human perfection or live above humanity like gods, his upbringing explains his fascination with godlike heroes. They lack human characteristics because they transcend mortal problems. Jonathan Livingston Siegel is about an exceptional bird who defies conformity, follows his passion, and becomes great at what he does. Because this is the kind of character that Snyder relates to, this is probably how he wants to live his own life. He sees himself as a nonconformist who wants to tell stories about other free-thinking renegades. It's starting to make sense, isn't it? Another of Snyder's favorite books is The Fountainhead by Ayn Rand. The story follows a brilliant young architect named Howard Rourke. Now he's an outcast among his peers because he refuses to conform, much like Jonathan Livingston Siegel. Do you want to stand alone against the whole world? There's no place for originality in architecture. Dancers shouldn't kick too high and buildings mustn't reach the sky. <laughs> But the story of the novel is overshadowed by the philosophy it propagates, objectivism. According to the blog Ethics page, this is defined as the belief that unfettered self-interest is good and altruism is destructive. Fountainhead author Ayn Rand was a champion of objectivism. She believed that a truly heroic man is one who serves his own self-interest. In other words, the individual is more pure than the collective, and a person should never sacrifice their own desires for the common good. You know, bullshit. Snyder has backed away from the Fountainhead's philosophy, saying, people will think it's hardcore right-wing propaganda, but I don't view it like that. I just think the story is super fun and crazy and melodramatic about architecture and sex. I'm gonna keep politics out of this video. Yes, some conservatives like Ayn Rand, and so do some liberals, and I just don't care. I'm only interested in these themes as they relate to Snyder's work. So Snyder favors novels about strong, nonconformist individuals who make their own rules and become legends. It's easy to see why he was attracted to 300 and The Watchmen, but individualism is not a hallmark of Superman. He represents collectivism, the idea that even though he's exceptional, he only works for the common good of others. I just wish you could all see the earth the way that I see it. Because when you really look at it, it's just one world. Superman isn't Superman because he has powers. He's super because he chooses to use those powers to be kind. That's it. Like my old friend Kurt Vonnegut said, damn it, babies, you have to be kind. So now that we've speculated about his worldview, let's see how it applies to his interpretation of Clark Kent. Man of Steel is Snyder's vision. 
elements of this story have appeared in other comics, but this Clark Kent is a creation of Zack Snyder. It's why the movie was so jarring for Superman fans like me, and why he spoke to some new fans who never cared for the character before. He told the Wall Street Journal, I was surprised with the fervency of the defense of the concept of Superman. I feel like fans were taking it personally that I was trying to grow up their character. So what is it Snyder thinks makes for a grown-up character in a grown-up story? Is it muted color tones? The world reacting to Superman with fear? Or is it his moral philosophy? See, despite what Snyder says, you can't separate Ayn Rand's stories from her philosophy because her beliefs permeate all of her novels. So on some level, Ryan's message of individualism resonates with Zack Snyder's creative process, especially since he reinvented Superman in the mold of Rand's view of individualism. Rand said that man is only a heroic being if his own happiness is the moral purpose of his life. Snyder's Superman is a perfect reflection of this philosophy. He isn't guided by moral responsibility or altruism like Superman of the past. Instead, he acts in his own self-interest. William Bradley wrote a terrific piece on Man of Steel for the LA Review of Books where he says, we never get the sense that Superman is doing these things because he feels like he ought to be doing them. That, like Spider-Man, he feels some sense of great responsibility that must come with his great power. At no point in either of Zack Snyder's Superman movies do we ever get the sense that this character is really sacrificing anything for the benefit of others. When Clark was a child, he acted for the good of others when he saved a school bus. And then immediately, the world punished him for it. My son was there. He was in the bus. He saw what Clark did. And his father, a far cry from the salt of the earth, depression era Jonathan Kent we've seen in the past, actually gets him in trouble. We talked about this. You have, oh, Clark, you have to keep this side of yourself a secret. Snyder told the Wall Street Journal that Superman is the first responder who gets sued by the guy he saves. Thousands of years ago, the first man discovered how to make fire. He was probably burned at the stake he had taught his brothers to light. In other words, altruism, doing good for the sake of good, will be punished. Snyder prefers a hero who performs good deeds because he wants to, and not out of obligation. Each man must live as an end in himself and follow his own rational self-interest. Bradley points out that after Jonathan Kent's stern talking to, Clark never puts himself or his own freedom in any serious jeopardy. He does save the oil workers, but this places him in no danger and doesn't expose his secret. He saves the earth from Zod because he lives there, and they threaten his mother. Cool motive, still murder. He saves Lois because he loves her, and then makes out in the ashes of the dead for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine seconds. When the Capitol building blows up, he's not horrified at the death. He's just kind of bummed out or bored. And then he flies away instead of helping people on the scene. Wait a minute, where are you going? Bradley also points out that even in Batman vs Superman, he doesn't know that he's sacrificing his life at the end of the movie, like he did in the comics back in 92. Wonder Woman has Doomsday pinned down and Superman is flying in to deliver the killing blow. He didn't knowingly sacrifice his life. Oh, look at that. I've been impaled. Now compare this moment to say this. And I am Iron Man. Plus, this has always bugged me. He ruined this trucker's livelihood because he embarrassed him. You embarrassed me. This Clark Kent was raised by his stern father to be the ultimate Randian hero. He refuses to recognize any authority that tells him how or when to use his powers. I'm here to help, but it has to be on my own terms. Now, learning all of this helped me understand one of my biggest problems with Man of Steel, and it's the one scene that I think exemplifies the Snyderverse. Now, Clark, following the advice of his father, has kept his ability secret for years. He's a young man, still trying to figure out how he wants to live his life, because he knows that once he decides to use his abilities for others, it's a big commitment to always be that guy. Jonathan told him, When the world finds out what you can do, it's gonna change everything. Now, I always thought that he meant the presence of a Superman would change the society geopolitical balance of the planet. If people knew they weren't alone in the universe, then it would change how Earthlings saw themselves. But that's actually not what Jonathan Kent was talking about. Clark embraces the use of his superpowers and his Kryptonian heritage after he visits the ship and learns to fly, much like Jonathan Taylor Siegel. But in time, they will join you when the sun comes. But unlike in most superhero movies, Easy miss, I've got you. 
he doesn't run off and start saving people. He goes to visit his mom. What's happened here is that he's transcended his old life of pretending to live as a normal man, and he's become something exceptional. He is that seagull who's become great at flying. This doesn't mean that he's decided to use his abilities to help people, only that he's embraced that this is who he is. He is a superior being. After Zod arrives on Earth, he says, and then he demands that Kal-El reveal himself, and yet Clark hesitates. That ship that appeared last night, the one they're looking for. And now it's not because the presence of an alien will upset the geosociopolitical nature of the planet. Aliens are here, and the Earth is under threat, and yet he hesitates. There's a chance I can save Earth by turning myself in. Shouldn't I take it? Duh. And then later he goes on to say, Zod can't be trusted. The problem is, I'm not sure the people of Earth can be either. This is perfectly spelling out Ayn Rand's worldview. Clark isn't altruistic. He does not believe the best in humanity. He worries that revealing himself will make people weak because they'll rely on him. He's worried that the people will turn on him. And then, most importantly, he will no longer have any say in his own life. By revealing himself, he's making a commitment to hand over his free will and be persecuted by the people that he's here to save. Jonathan wasn't worried about Clark changing the world. He was worried about the world taking away his son's choice. He teaches Clark to value his own happiness above all else, even his own life. You don't owe this world a thing. You never did. And note the oh-so-subtle symbolism here, framing Clark like he's Christ. Christians believe that Jesus was a celestial being, the Son of God, and he was sent to Earth to suffer and die for the sins of humanity. The Christ imagery, not subtle. We're long, we're I think this exemplifies the Snyderverse because it has this pretty but obvious framing, but also because this scene expresses Zack Snyder's central thesis, that the people with strength know best. These heroes are gods, and they're above the petty squabbles of mortal beings. Look no further than the Snyder Cut. When discussing the resurrection of Superman, there's no real dissension in the team. It's implied that, of course the heroes can resurrect Superman, they're gods, and that's what gods do. I mean, we have to try. Don't we? We have to try. But really bad person Joss Whedon attempted to add an MCU spin into this scene, where the heroes argue about playing God. Right, right. But we mean bring him back in like a yay, he's back way, not in like a like a pet cemetery scenario. But in the Snyderverse, you can't play God if you are God. I am a God, you dull creature. And in the Snyder Cut, no hero joins the team out of obligation. Like Rand's heroes, they have decided to join up to serve their own needs. I need friends. And they are not asked to make a personal sacrifice. And I'm not saying any of this is necessarily bad. The Snyder Cut's pretty good. It just has different kinds of heroes. So what's the theme of the MCU? Well, it can really be expressed in one speech. There was an idea to bring together a group of remarkable people. The Marvel Cinematic Universe was created by several people working together. It's a beast with many fathers. But the tone and humor were created by Jon Favreau. Iron Man is very much in the mold of the indie films that Favreau had already written and directed. Favreau had mostly made comedies, so Iron Man took on a comedic tone. Let's face it, this is not the worst thing you've caught me doing. There's a lot of Ricky from Made and Tony Stark. So you can drink as much as you want up front, have a nice thing, we'll get our videos going. If we didn't have to uh, be on call, we could drink as much as we want. You are constitutionally song. incapable of being responsible. It would be irresponsible not to drink. I'm just talking about a nightcap. In its first few years, Marvel Studios also had a creative committee that supervised the films and made sure their choices aligned with the comics. This stymied creators, but it kept the tone consistent. And also, all-around bad person Joss Whedon oversaw all of Stage 2, and, in opposition to the creative committee, protected the visions of creators like James Gunn. And the thing that you said to me, which I share all the time, was just make it more James Gunn. After the creative committee was dissolved, the universe has largely been handed over to Kevin Feige. Feige is a huge comics fan, and even on the set of X-Men, as a lowly associate producer, he was fighting to make Hugh Jackman's hair as comic accurate as possible. We went through a lot of, a lot of tests to, to get the look of Wolverine, because he has to have that look. It's so um, emblematic of the character. Now the studio operates with Feige creating a larger framework of the story, and then hiring indie directors and visionaries like John Watts and Taika Waititi to play in this universe. 
I want to know how they let you go full Taika for that entire movie. True. The Marvel Cinematic Universe is a collaborative effort. It was created to bring superheroes together in team-up movies. As opposed to Snyder's individualism, Marvel Studios represents collectivism. The idea that it's a team effort, not the sole vision of one person. Even as Marvel embraced the auteur model by hiring Taika Waititi, Jon Favreau, Shane Black, and James Gunn, these creators still contribute to a larger whole. By assimilating other beings into our collective, we are bringing them closer to perfection. Even James Gunn, the sole voice of the Guardians of the Galaxy, had to hand over Gamora to the Russo brothers so she could be killed. Even in the movies, the theme is about collectivism. The Avengers is about individuals with strong personalities overcoming their differences for the greater good. In a way, they have no choice. What if I say no? I'll persuade you. They surrender their own will to the whole. Justice League is about individuals making a decision who never doubt that decision. In the MCU, every single character is always trying to prove that they're worthy. Like being a superhero is a privilege and not a right. Steve tries to live up to the shield. Tony lives up to his father's legacy in Jensen's last words. Peter Parker is motivated by guilt and responsibility. The chance to earn that look in your daughter's eyes. In the Snyderverse, characters are worthy by birth. They're seen as a gift to humanity. Instead, it's the people who have to prove that they're worthy of the gods. I'm not sure the people of Earth can be either. Marvel sees service to others as an honor, while the Snyderverse treats service as a burden. With great power comes great micromanaging. So, what is the scene that I think defines Marvel Studios? It's pretty simple. There's no visual effects or quippy dialogue. It's from Iron Man. Tony has just had... What alcoholics refer to as a moment of clarity. He's figuring out what to do with his life, how to live up to Jensen's sacrifice. Don't waste it. Don't waste your life. He's perfecting the arc reactor, developing his suit, but he's hit some snacks. While recuperating, he opens a birthday gift from Pepper, a display of his first arc reactor, the device that literally changed his heart and set him down a path of self-sacrifice. Remember, earlier he told Pepper, Destroy it. Incinerate it. Just like the old callous Tony Stark would have. It's a piece. But she responded to him with kindness and sentimentality. This moment of connection where Pepper is able to break through Tony's cynicism is elegant. It's the beginning of Tony allowing himself to work with others and be part of a collective. And of course, later, this simple act of kindness saves his life, just as this arc reactor has already saved his soul. This is a touching moment where a man is forced to find strength in his vulnerabilities. And there's nothing more human or more Marvel than that. But that's just my thoughts. Let me know yours down in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.